Good morning. Welcome to Books at the Bottom of the Stairs. My name's Lorene. Welcome back if you are a, a viewer from time ago and welcome if you are new. Uh, it's a new year and I generally do not set resolutions. I have found in the past that they are a recipe for total disaster and um, oh, I thought Missy was trying to get up the stairs but no. Uh, she's the little cat who's not very friendly and she thinks it's her idea of a game is to just keep walking past us and looking at us like there's a message and then when you try and figure out what it is that she's after then she she tears off and uh, but she doesn't want you near her she doesn't want you to touch her or pick her up or anything it's just let me walk past you and run so it's a very sophisticated game so what i do instead as a rule i try to um, make sure that all my piles are reorganized that, you know, if it's a stack of knitting or a stack of sewing or um, chores of some sort, or, you know, I try to go through them and, and groom them, get rid of something that I realize no, that's just not going to happen and um, reprioritize in terms of, yeah, I feel excited about this or I feel excited about that. But it's, that's about as good as it gets. And, you know, you can tell from all the books here, it's sort of a wobbly process and so I just kind of go with not so much I'm not so much a mood reader and a mood doer as um, I'm more impulsive yeah doesn't have too much to do with mood it has to do with like ah that feels crazy so um just in conclusion to the uh, cozy Christmas readathon I have been paying attention and doing most of the prompts that Gina has suggested and um, the last time we spoke, it was to read something short each day and, and a children's book, which I did accomplish. And we're working our way through a thousand piece puzzle. And I don't know that I will choose that particular brand of puzzle again. Actually, the puzzle, like the puzzle pieces themselves and the color and so on, they're fine. It's just there's big fields of um, color that are barely discernible from each other and so right now I'm working on a shoreline and a cactus and they're virtually the same color and I have way more pieces of puzzle than I have spots for so that sort of thing just kind of aggravates me in the end it's not really that much fun so um, I will try no I don't know if I'll get a picture up on it because we're not finished and this will go up before we're finished so it'll be a mystery for you guys too I did read a vintage um, Christmas book and it it's not really a Christmas book has a small story uh, Truman Capote short story wrote a Christmas memory and it's a really it's a charming story until you get to the end where it's just so sad it it's really sad so buddy and um, his friend who is a relative who's 60 years old are cousins and she's what they would have called simple in the day and so she's she's sort of at the mercy of relatives you know who's going to let her live with them and she doesn't have a very um she doesn't have a lot of autonomy in her life but she at least she's not in an institution and a buddy who's quite young she, um and and this lady the, live they live together we're close together anyhow every Christmas what they do is uh, they make fruit pies uh, you know like the um, Christmas pudding pies uh, well, not pies what are they called cakes and so they work their way all year round saving money and getting stuff together and relative gets them the, the uh, booze that they need to make these cakes and then they send one to um, President Roosevelt and you know a few famous actors and they do get letters back in terms of you know thank you for your cake and so on and they make about 30 and as the years go by this is like this is a, a great focus for them and it's a great fun time that they do and so this is the story about that but then of course Buddy ages and um, the lady who's not named um, they she diminishes a little bit so as we get to the end it's sad it has a sad ending but it was a really it's a charming story and i've never bumped into it before and you know truman capote can really write i really um he creates a scene he creates a character he's very um 
economical in his sentences, but they are not, um, what's the word? They are not simple sentences. They're just very clean cut with not a whole lot of verbiage around it. So yeah, very, very good uh, little story. I recommend it. Um, then the other thing we were supposed to do was watch an old movie or musical and we watched The Lady Eve, which is black and white with Cary Grant and um, Brenda Henry Stott. Fonda. Sorry, what? Henry Fonda. <laughs> Henry Fonda, thank you, Steve. And uh, Barbara Steinwick. And it takes place initially on a yacht and there's a woman who is the daughter of a, um, a card shark. They've set a con up and they con this rich, young, naive man and they fall in love, but they fall in love for real. And then things transpire and things go aglay. And so the woman in the story is miffed at how things have gone. So she decides to do a real con on this guy. And so we see the next con, which is very clever and doesn't involve any disguises. She, she is the twin sister of the, uh, that's what she says, she's the twin sister of the woman that he initially fell in love with. So there's a whole secondary romance and it's quite comical. Um, and then there's a tertiary <laughs> con and it's, it's really well plotted. It's um, not dramatically surprising and the acting isn't, amazing in any kind of a way, but it's it's well staged and the secondary characters are strong and um, the the both of the two actors that play the fathers are well done. And yeah, so I would recommend that. I'll see if I can get that information um, in the doobly-doo because I've learned how to do that, or at least a little bit. The next one was read historical fiction and that brings me back to Truman Capote where I read Breakfast at Tiffany's. Um, sorry, someone has asked for this book to uh, be passed along to them. I really enjoyed it. I, I didn't remember um, Holly's trips. She, there's someone in the prison system that she goes and chats with and he gives her a code sentence and she goes back to her apartment and she rings a number and she says the code sentence and so, so she's sort of a, a messenger and I guess she knows it a little bit but she's a lady who um, hmm, doesn't look too deeply <laughs> into the workings of her life but she's always kind of on the edge of, of disaster but also on the edge of success and and the ending in the book is different than the ending in the movie. And I think in the end, I think ultimately I prefer the one in the book. It's taken me a little while to kind of think my way through that and um, realize that, yeah, that in the movie they wouldn't have, have liked the uh, Truman Capote ending at all. So that was my vintage book. Now, historical fiction, rather. I just finished talking to my girlfriend, Cheryl, and the prompt for today is to go out for tea. And, you know, chat, 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 and what are you doing? She goes, well, I'm back on my diet. I'm having this and that. And I go, oh, well, guess what? I'm calling to destroy your intentions. So um, we decided instead of going out for tea, I'm going to go to her place and we'll have a cup of tea and a biscuit and not ruin her first intentions. Um, and tomorrow is choose a book for 2023 and well that's happened I have January and February and March and way in the back is April May June so I think I'm doing okay on that prompt well the other thing I wanted to chat to you about were the books that I read at the end of um, December and the uncommoners was one that I had mentioned to you guys as a middle reader uh, mystery book. It's The Crooked Sixpence. It's the beginning of a series and I got to about page uh, like 120. I just I couldn't buy into it. Uh, the the world building, it was a peculiar world, it, it, the underground London and they're called the uncommoners and average, you know, like a book part, a bookmark for instance is not a bookmark. It might turn out to be a shower or there's just some completely random things that happen between what seems to be a common object and what it actually functions as in this world. And her brother has been picked up by the police. There seems to be something happening with respect to a grandmother who's sick in hospital. 
in the upper world of London and it was just taking too long, taking too long to build the world and not to really get to either the dilemma with the mom or the dilemma with the brother and uh, yeah, just, um, it was not a fruitful read so I let it go. Um, now I had two cozy reads, both ja recommended from Gina. Now Gina's been very busy in my life. This <laughs> this last few weeks. This is uh, Mrs. Jeffries and the Yuletide Weddings by Emily Brightwell, and it's a cozy read series that she recommends. And there are quite a lot of books in this series. Um, I'm going to just keep my eyes peeled for it, you know, whenever I'm in the mood for it, something that's um, enjoyable, well-crafted, well-described, then I'm just going to put this sort of on my my back burner for those moments. I don't know how many our local library has, so... Uh, probably not as many as has been published, but a few, I hope. So um, that's one series that I recommend. The other book that she recommended is How to Find Love in a Bookshop by Veronica Henry. Um, I would say I didn't love this one as much as Mrs. Jeffries, and Mrs. Jeffries is pretty formulaic. This one is kind of sweet. It takes place in a bookstore. Sarah is the new owner of the, um, um, hang on, Nightingale Books. It, not Sarah, I'm sorry. Amelia is the owner of it. Her dad has passed away. She's inherited the bookstore. It's not doing that well. He's really been... Um, it's for him it's more of a way of life than it is a business so it's financially in a bit of trouble and Emilia gets this inheritance that she's got to sort of pull out of the dirt as it were and so we see this journey and we see also that the patrons of the bookstore who were good friends of Mr. Nightingale have emptinesses in their lives and so through the bookstore and through Amelia and through the the, the uprising of the bookstore, we start to see um, the people in the story become more, um, what's that word, realized, happy, <laughs> fulfilled. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice book. And um, does she have anything else on the go? Let me see. Uh, she must because she has won the Romantic Novelists Association uh, Award. So... Um, yeah, so there must be something else. That is on my to-do list to see whether she does have other offerings. Now, I finished the book on a number five. I loved this book. Curse So Dark and Lonely by Bridget Kemmerer. It's a YA fantasy. I, I loved this book. I It's kind of, sort of, it's a sort of book that I haven't read in ages where you really get into the world of the, the fantasy world. Um, it's very well described. The characters are very interesting. They're not expected, especially. I mean, I, they're not as, you know, they're like they are. They're stereotypes in a way, but they're well drafted and and they've got concerns that are somewhat different than what's normal. So we've got the two main characters, which are basically Beauty and the Beast. And a Beauty in this case is called oh dear oh dear, Ren, and. Oh no, I'm sorry, that's the beast. The beast is Ren, and the beauty, Harper, <laughs> has cerebral palsy. So Harper, in her own way, is um, somewhat disfigured as is the beast. And the beast, it's the sort of typical curse, uh, a vain young man, he did something to annoy a magical person, that person cursed them, and um, there's a bit of a Groundhog Day thing in that he keeps, he keeps having to try and engage with women in order to get them to love him, but he keeps failing. And so eventually um, Harper comes on the scene more by accident than by design. And um, they start to, she's unlike the other women that have shown up who, who have been tricked or coerced or bribed or that sort of thing to come into the beast's world. Whereas Harper is there by accident, so she doesn't have these kinds of, oh yes, I want to be a princess, and oh yes, I, I want lots of money and dresses and stuff. She is like, I want to get out of here, you're a pain in my neck, um, I've got things to do, and then along the way realizes that the community is faltering, he's not doing as great a job as he could as a prince because he's got this evil person that just keeps 
re-sabotaging and re-sabotaging. So there's also his personal guard, um, who's called Gray, and um, turn, transpires that Gray will move into the second book. And I believe there are three in this. So uh, the sequel, A Heart So Fierce and Broken, I'm looking forward to. I'm gonna put that on my to-do list. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I really was immersed in it. I picked a bad time to read it I, when the kids were here and it was like, oh no, pay attention to my family, read my book. Oh, choices, choices. So um, yeah, that was, uh, I, I, if I, had saved this book for when the kids left, that would have been perfect. But anyhow, I, I really enjoyed it. And um, what else can I say about this book? I think the other part that was interesting is that there is some connection between the world where the curse takes place and Harper's world. Not a very tenuous window of being able to move back and forth and it takes magic and neither Harper nor uh, the beast have access to this magic but Grey and uh, the evil person do. So I think that's what might happen in the next book is there might be a bit more travel between, but I really don't know. Yeah, so super duper, glad that I ended on a, a strong note. Yeah, so that's it for me. I hope all your reading dreams and adventures come true for this coming year. And um, I've got a few things up my sleeve that I'm hoping to do. Um, and we'll talk about them as time goes by. Bye-bye for now.